Okay, right. So, <coughs> three meetings on. I uh, formally declare this meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee open. Um, we've had uh, this, this is we've had no apologies, um, and everybody is present. Are there any declarations of interest that any member wishes to make? Okay, thank you. Um, I have a few announcements. Um, we were expecting at this meeting the final version of the 2021 accounts and the annual government statement. But you'll remember at our last meeting um, that the external auditors were waiting to receive the actuary's uh, report on the final pension balances. Since then, we've been informed by the external auditor that as a result of commentary by regulatory bodies uh, to other audit firms, the auditor needs to update their procedures around the verification of data. The EY partner who is now responsible for the CPCA has advised us that this, uh, due to their requirement for additional audit evidence, they could not provide assurance that they would be able to issue and sign an audit opinion by the date of this committee. Could I just finish what I was going to say? Thank you. Um, given the uncertainty of the audit position, um, I didn't feel it was appropriate that we should meet yet again to look at the accounts without having to delegate some authorities to the chair. So I took the decision to defer taking these uh, accounts until your external audit work is finished, which will be at our next meeting. And that will also include uh, the final uh, approval of the annual government statement after we've seen the comments from the auditors. Sorry, you had a question. Well, it's just that we approve, well, we finally approve our accounts this week in Cambridge, but um, we will do next week, I think. And I don't quite understand what EY is saying because. Um, is there something extra that the combined authority is suffering with over um, what uh, Cambridge City Council is suffering with? Thank you, um, Councillor Sargent. Now, I spoke to Mark Hodgson yesterday to get an update um, from, uh, from where EY are. Um, so the, the issue was that we were just about to um, publish the papers when EY told us that there was this um, issue with FRC um, and they needed to um, get their technical department to talk to the actuaries to understand what the actuaries issues were um, and for the technical department then to uh, understand and um, to determine what additional procedures needs to, needed to be done. So it was at that point um, there was a decision taken that, that um, that Mark uh, Hodgson from EY wasn't in a position to be able to uh, to guarantee that they would be able to sign off the audit. Um, so that was the decision taken at the time. I've since spoken to Mark. They have um, now sorted out all of the issues with um, raised by um, the FRC and with their technical department. Actually, now they have completed all of their work. Um, so it turns out that they would have been in a position to sign the, the accounts off. Um, but um, it wasn't it wasn't, wasn't certain at that time, um, so we should be in a good position to bring them back um, in November um, to be able to uh, uh, to complete everything. Thank you. Um, my other point is it is as we got into for the first time in our previous civic year, it one of our obligations is to look at the constitution and the annual constitution review. And that time is approaching and the advice I've been given is it would be useful if we had a informal Zoom session sometime in October so we could be uh, given an insight into the sorts of changes and, uh, and amendments of the Constitution that we will need to consider at our next meeting. So um, and we'll come out to members with some possible dates uh, and how long do you think a, a session would take? Uh, it would be an hour session online, uh, just so that we're better prepared at the November meeting to conduct the business regarding the constitution. Do I take it, members? Oh, comfortable with that. We do. It would be. 
We are looking for a good turnout uh, for the informal session, but as it's going to be from wherever you do your Zooming, it shouldn't be too much of an imposition, I hope. Okay, that's all the announcements I, I, I had. Uh, we now go on to the minutes of the last meeting and the action log, uh, which we are asked to approve. Are there any comments or are we happy to approve? I take that with contempt. Sorry, Dave, David Brown. I know I wasn't there, but I did notice one typo in the minutes. It's on 11.5, I think, from memory. I did send it through in writing. It just needs to be corrected. Thank you, David. And thank you for your, your careful eye on these matters, which I value greatly. Uh, the, com the combined authority update, uh, I received a late apology from uh, Kim Sawyer, the chief executive. Uh, she has a diary clash and is currently uh, at a meeting with uh, this alphabet soup of the Ministry of Housing, Communities, Local Government. Is that right? It's actually just recently changed its name. Oh, so. no. <laughs> what is it called now? Question. Well, whilst we're checking on that, anyway, it's a CEO, uh, a chief executive's meeting from Oxford and Cairns, uh, which she had to go to. Uh, she did send me uh, a little insight. Um, she advises that the CPCA is largely ticking along pending the arrival of the new CEO, that's Eileen Milner, who takes up appointment on the 4th of October. Uh, there is nothing to report, says Kim, that cannot be gleaned from the public reports as our policy and strategy work is progressing quietly until Eileen's arrival. Um, if there are any questions on current activities of the, uh, of the CPCA, Robert Parkin will do his best to um, field them. I will be meeting uh, fairly soon after her arrival with Eileen, uh, and one of the points I would emphasize is the importance that we as members place on the chief executive attending our meetings. Does anybody have any points they want to ask Rob? No, thank you. Um, that takes us to the internal audit progress report. Um, unfortunately, Jay Desai, who was due to represent the internal audit uh, reports is unable to attend for COVID reasons. Uh, so Louise Davis, who I've not met Louise, um, uh, is, has kindly stepped in uh, uh, to present the RSM reports. Louise, you want to come and sit in the front and you can use the microphone then. Uh, and we also have with us uh, um, Adam, Adam Goldsmith from the ICT provider, head of IT, who will, uh, um, is available to ask questions, but he will just say a few words introducing the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the IT audit information. There's probably space here too, because it would be useful from the point of view of the microphones, Adam, if you came and joined us. Um, do you want to say anything, John, by way of introduction? Yeah, I'm happy to, to introduce the paper. So this is, this is to introduce two reports from RSM, um, which members will remember were deferred from the, the previous meeting due to technical difficulties. Um, the first um, report is the annual report for 2020-21, um, which includes reference to the IT control framework review, which was given only minimal assurance in the review. Um, Command Authority took immediate action um, uh, to address the control weaknesses highlighted in the report and engaged Soccer Tim uh, to implement measures <clears throat> to, to quickly address um, those, those issues and to work through the recommendations that were put forward by RSM. And we've got um, uh, Adam Goldsmith um, here, a representative from Socrates, to provide the committee with an update of the work that they have, they have done 
and um, the work that they're planning to do to make sure that the IT control environment is secure for the future. Um, second report is an update report against the 2021-22 internal audit plan. Um, we did receive a question in advance of the meeting um, to, to give a bit of clarification on the management concern that's prompted the payroll um, review, which wasn't on the original internal audit plan. Um, and these were, they have been set out in the, uh, the scoping um, document, which was uh, approved by CMT earlier on in the week. Um, but there have been a number of, um, of, of recent payroll errors that have been identified, including uh, calculation of pension uh, contributions, um, which has led us to request RSM uh, to review the current arrangements. We, we currently have uh, payroll provided by an outside um, uh, service provider. Um, so we've asked them to look at each of the errors in, in more detail uh, and to con consider um, the agreement that we currently have with the payroll provider and to, uh, to consider whether we've got sufficient in-house capability uh, to properly oversee and, and manage the service being provided. Um, as I said, we've got, um, uh, we've got uh, Louise and Adam uh, who hope to all be able to to provide us with an update from RSM and an update on the IT that's been worked deep that Socketing has been doing. Second aspect of the annual report is as was presented last time. I know there were some questions raised offline with Dan, and we have reflected the responses to those in our progress report under other matters. So, in terms of the annual governance statement, we have suggested a further addition in relation to explaining that management actions have been agreed to address the minimal assurance opinion. So I hope that satisfies the queries that were raised on the back of the annual report. So in terms of the progress report here today, I think obviously the main review to be considered is the IT control framework review, which was given a minimal assurance opinion. The other reviews, the impact of COVID-19 on project delivery had a reasonable assurance opinion with some issues identified around completion of project initiation documents and issues with highlight report commentary, but overall a positive opinion with reasonable assurance. And the other review being a grants COVID-19 emergency active travel fund, where a final report has been issued and we are satisfied with the sums that were paid over in relation to that grant. In terms of the timetable, it has been slightly refreshed, so there is a refreshed timetable for the year in these papers from the previous one seen, and we have also reflected on there the additional payroll review. I'm happy to take any questions, but obviously, given I'm standing in for Jay, I may need to go back to him if there, there are any detailed questions on these papers. Adam, you, you, Adam do you want to say a few words on the IT audit before I open to the floor? Yeah, sure. So, good morning. I'm Adam Goldsmith, Head of IT for Socketim and representing uh, CPCA. Uh, we took over the IT support function in July of this year. We were presented with the RSM audits that highlighted some fundamental issues with the security and compliance of the IT platform. Since then, we've taken a number of measures to rectify and to solidify the security. One being endpoint security and others being around the way that you manage your data estates. So we can now run full reports against activities on particular users, rather than just it being a pot of audits with no real meaning. Moving forward, we are looking at the policies and procedures behind the IT function. Um, the reason for this is if we were to depart as an IT function, could another provider come in and pick off where we left off? And the answer is no, not at the moment. So we are taking steps to document all the policies and procedures related to that. Some are legally binding around acceptable usage, fair usage, device agreements, uh, damage device agreements, uh, and some around the GDPR impacts that IT obviously cover. Well, I'm, I'm happy to receive a note, but I would like to just clarify on the IT um, re review. W what length of contract do you now have, Adam, and how confident are you that 
all the, the things which were discovered during the audit either have been rectified or will be rectified very quickly. And then the, the other question was relating to the risk review. Um, it talks about meetings with individuals, but maybe that's something which Robert can address. Um, we've got later on various papers about risk registers. Again, are we confident that all the points that were raised by internal audit on risk register, risk um, treatment have been dealt with properly? Yeah, sure. So in relation to the contract, we've got it secured to the 1st of January 2022 uh, with an extension of three months if required whilst they go out to tender. Uh, during that time, we've also made a lot of headway already, and we expect to and um, discuss with Farjad uh, from RSM that we would have had completed all the highlighted impacts done by the end of our contract. Just to follow up on that one, yeah, so we're also alongside the uh, this intervention that, that uh, we um, encouraged at uh, Soccer Tim, we're preparing a route to market for a permanent provider um, and maybe that Socketon choose to bid on that um, but but yeah so that's underway and we're, 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 we're confident we'll meet the timeline and we're certainly confident that as between the work that Adam and his team are doing and the way that we complete the process that whoever comes out on top of that process will be able to carry the work forward and continue with the um, baseline standards that we require in which the RSM audit um, indicated may be missing for us. Do you want me to just add on the response around the um, risk matter? So this this is risk in relation to the the way that we the the the, the report on on the way that we're um, as it were managing risk in the organisation. Um, yeah, and again, there's a there's a piece of work there that actually um, the team and I spoke to um, the RSM this week, where we're, we're we're inviting them to come and work with us to look at our processes, look at our strategy, and, and also just look internally. To make sure that the way that that as a as a group of officers when we're across the organization managing risk and highlighting it so, so that's another piece of work that's underway we expect them to to, to to have that completed in the next six to eight weeks and any changes to practice for the organization will be discussed with the new chief executive and the directors um, and correspondingly any changes and updates to the strategy this committee will see Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a slight concern that it's taken an internal audit to pick up uh, these risks with the IT controls. Is the IT team or department checking these things regularly through checks and balances, or is this something that is outside your initial scope? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll answer that. So, so we don't have an internal IT, uh, IT team. We're, we're a small organisation and the entire service um, is, as it were, commissioned, but they are as it were, internal. Um, John and I, um, early discussions actually considered actually it was a good thing to invite RSM to look at IT. I came into the organisation about 18 months ago and, and had a sense that actually we needed a set of expert eyes to look at what we had um, uh, and to tell us where we may have may have things missing. And, and, and that was a part of a piece of work. There was also another piece of work to look at our IT arrangements. So we twin tracked it. Um, but didn't, you know, took an unflinching approach and thought, actually, you know, we need to have auditors here to make sure we're doing things fully. And that's taken us, I think, forward um, quite considerably. So, so yeah, um, uh, we don't have the internal provision, which is why we took the view that actually we needed external expertise on this. And that's taken us to this. Um, and, and actually, as we move forward to, um, to having a permanent IT provider, we'll be thinking about what internal versus external support we need to have that's that's really that really fits the organization and the need for proper expertise because i think the problem with an organization of 100 or so staff um it's very it's quite a fragile model that says you have a, a single uh, it expert because you know for various reasons that that's not necessarily doesn't necessarily have the resilience so so yeah hopefully there's an answer in there thank you Rob. And, I, and i did encourage uh, as i always encourage that i think executives should use the resources of internal audit to shine a light on those areas they're slightly uncomfortable with. So this 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 one the advice worked. So what do you do with me? Mike Sargent. Thanks, John. Um, 
So if I can just start with the internal audit first. Um, I'm still concerned, this is on page 18, um, at 2.5, where it um, paints a sort of middling picture of, of um, the situation here. Um, and similarly on page 22, where there's a graphic which sort of indicates that um, we're sort of doing okay. Um, but because IT is such a crucial part of the operation, I, I'm struggling to understand how something which underpins the whole operation perhaps um, would mean there's a middling performance. So if you've got one which is minimal assurance, can it on its own in effect, say we've got minimal, minimal assurance for the company. So that's that's my first question. Um, I mean, not all um, of these areas, of course, will be underpinning and cross the whole uh, organisation. Um, page twenty-three. It's actually saying not that there's minimal assurance for um, ICT. It's actually saying partial assurance. So I guess that's just a typo. Is it? I don't think there's a different, it, um, it's sort of part of the narrative which says we've got four which are okay and we've got one that's partial. I think it should say minimal on there. No, that partial assurance is our opinions that we have on uh, at, at the time. So we have changed our opinion. So we used to have partial or no assurance. Yeah. But we now have partial and minimal assurance. Yeah, but this so, is actually saying ICT is partial. So I assume at the time the work was done, I will go back and check that. But that later on in the report, it, um, it that does actually say minimal. So, it? so it's confusing, if you like. Right. Well, that must um, have been a, yeah. a mistake. Um, I'm pleased to see the addition to the AG uh, annual governance statement, which is being picked up, which is, which is good. I'm still very confused about the ICT provider because my understanding is that um, SOCTIM is a professional members organisation which has an advisory role. I note that you said you were just providing ICT support and obviously Robert said that things are in effect provided internally, um, whatever that means. So there's not a professional um, provider here at the moment. So are we going after January for a professional provider of the service? And currently, um, Socotim are advising the internal team um, on what they should be doing in developing the policy. So longer term, we will bring in an outside body to run the ICT. Um, so, about the history. Yeah, I, think, I think that's probably true of the history of Socketim. We don't probably not, don't need to go into it, but this is very much this is a new this is an arm of Socketim that are a service provider. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not, they're not here to, telling us from the background how things could be. That they're, they're, they're directly providing the service, and that's a <coughs> that's a, um, that's a, 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 certainly something that we have great confidence in having appointed them and and seeing it underway and, and following the process. It may be that <coughs> it may be that it would be an open process. It may be that they're successful it is them but they are very much a provider just on back onto the content of this report yes i think i think it needs to be caveated the items around ict that the rsm have yet to carry out the follow-up formal review which would indicate the positive things that adam is talking about and i am trusting are being delivered as to that raised security standard so I'm fully confident that a future report from RSM will change the contents of this, this audit. But as you see it now, they haven't had the formal opportunity to conduct that evidence-based review and report it into this committee. When will this review be follow up? Um, so I spoke to RSM this week and they've advised to re-audit in the new fiscal year, which whenever CPCA's fiscal year starts, that's when we'll be re-audited. So John, I had two questions really. One was really on the overall um, on page 18, which, as I say, paints a middling picture. 
So if there is a, an overarching um, service, if you like, such as ICT, um, could that actually trump all the good performance elsewhere? And are we accepting my amendment on page 23? Please, can you, I mean, this is about how you arrive at an overall judgment yeah, yeah. on an organisation yeah. when it's um, uh, curating. So when we, so if we take the, the first one about the, um, our overall opinion in the uh, head of internal audit opinion. So we actually look at the work that we've done during the year. So there will be a number of reviews that feed into that because we're looking at the um, overall risk management and governance arrangements for the organisation. Mm -hmm. What we also take into consideration at that point is also um, any actions that have been implemented, what progress has been made, what the um, client has agreed to do about those actions. So it's, I think it goes back to the point where you were saying about actually using internal audit in the right way. So asking us to look at those areas where potentially we've got issues. For us, the important thing is, can we see that you're addressing those issues and that you've got a clear plan of action in? And that will be considered when... Dan is formulating his head of internal audit opinion. So he will have taken that into consideration. So just because you have one or two partial or minimal assurance opinions doesn't mean that will have a negative impact on your head of internal audit opinion. It may do if we can see that the organisation isn't taking those actions seriously or if there isn't a clear plan of action to address those. So that is what Dan will have taken into consideration when formulating his opinion. And in terms of the second point, yes, that, that is an error in the progress report, and I'll get that amended and get the progress report reissued to you. Page 23 is the progress report. Yes, where, where we've said partially. Thank you, Chair. Uh, probably a question for. Robert, I assume, uh, looking at page 28, uh, we've got this kind of traffic light system starting from green, which is, I assume, very good, all the way down to red, which is in the danger zone. And at the moment, on the internal audit opinion, we're kind of half green and half yellow, uh, which I assume probably means we're average or above average. So, Robert, uh, obviously, the audit uh, committee here would like us to be in the green area. When do you expect or anticipate we might get to that stage? Um, obviously, as soon as possible. I can't answer that directly. If John's got any um, thoughts in response to that, I'm sorry, John, to, to just get you thinking about that whilst I'm just... Well, as you as you'd be aware, um, RSM um, have recently been Appointed, and what they um, their initial approach was a um, to create a risk based um, plan. Um, so they've been through all of our risk registers, highlighted the key areas, had discussions with members of staff uh, and the audit and governance committee as well to target areas where there is the greatest risk to the organisation. So they are working through that plan. Uh, and highlighting as other things as they become apparent, shining, shining the light on potential concerns. So we have raised, um, we've asked for them to do to to fast track some some reviews, such as IT. We've asked them to look at other specific things which weren't originally on the plan, like payroll. So we're kind of working through that as a as a journey. So the work won't be; it, it will never be completed because we will always need to review the risks that are up and coming and, and ask RSMT to uh, RSM, to, RSM to, um, uh, to, to look at those, um, those, those risks. So it will be an, an ongoing, um, but obviously we want to get to the, the green um, you know, assurance um, uh, uh, levels as, as, as quickly as we, as we possibly can. Before I ask one, I, I think, um... I was, I was on the audit committee of one organisation which was always in the green and that left me more uncomfortable than uh, being where we are now. I, and I think we have to be, 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 remember that this is a very new organisation um, and, and 
in, in the insurances we receive. Right? It's the openness and the clarity in which they, the, uh, the curate's eggs bits are made known to us, which it, it can be reassuring in, it, in itself. Mike. Taking us in a totally different direction. So on page 26, there's um, information in terms of what's going on elsewhere. Um, but the internal audit team for Cambridge City, South Cams, and um, Huntingdonshire, for instance, does have an advisory role as well. So it's particularly used when there are changes going on in the organization. So instead of coming along once things have are up and running, if you like. They sort of work alongside the delivery teams to um, to to give advice um, as a sounding board in various other ways, so that um, as processes are and procedures are developed, um, rather than waiting for them to be put in place and then um, review them, they are there as well. So I'm, it's a question really to uh, the command authority whether they are needing to um, ask RSM or whoever to provide that advisory role as well. Now, I think it's particularly important in a um, relatively new organization and but also an involving organization. So, obviously, I bring up the issue of um, becoming more operational, for instance, and uh, I wonder if it's a good idea for us to look at um, having RSM or whoever um, supporting us as we change our systems. Any good other? Yeah, I think John's going to jump in as well. Uh, that makes complete sense. In the, in, and it's uh, for me, the point there is that if we are making operational um, changes and uh, changes to our operating model or organization, then we need to be alongside or even in front of that uh, describing the systems of control and compliance that will sit around that activity and that's obviously part of this committee's work in terms of advising this committee and officers um, we have rsm uh, they are our internal auditor but but in appointing them we took the view and and uh, that, that we would also benefit Apart from their direct expertise in auditing us from from actually their ability to bring a comparative um, uh, perspective to us and experience from other organizations so 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 they carry a sort of dual role for us and then separately i think it's incumbent on us to bring to this committee and before them um propose you know an idea of where we have changes in the overall system so that we can keep pace with it um in terms of systems and controls John, sorry, JP, sorry, Chair, uh, John, also was going to. Sorry, really just, just to add, add to that. Obviously, when when we do get a, a report back from RSM, um, they do come with recommendations um, from uh, for us to, uh, to consider. Um, but also, one of the attractions of RSM when we went through the procurement process was that they have um, other um, expertise that they can they can draw on. Um, so, and that has been a great help, for example, when they were doing their, their IT reviews, but also they have, um, I know that <laughs> Louise will be able to uh, provide more detail, but things like systems um, support, so they have expertise in different areas that uh, they can call upon um, to help doing reviews and, and suggest the, uh, the management actions from that. Just before I do that. Uh, when we were, we'd be talking about trading companies, there's a point that was being made that you went to RSM, the CPCA went to RSM for advice or to scrutinize the changes to our terms of reference, recommended changes. Does that fall into the category that's behind the question? That you do, to the extent, do you use them for advice now? Uh, when you when things are evolving, or or is that not part of the problem? So, for example, on the risk management the piece that we're engaging them on to develop our capacity, capability, and expertise on risk management, that's a separate commission. It's outside the core contract that we look to, as it were, um, engage in addition. 
So we get the synergies of them, of parts of their organization having carried out the review and the audit, but then we know through discussions that they have capability on the advisory side to help bring us to a standard. So it's not always the case that, 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 that they'll have, that they'll come in with that full advisory piece, but as John's mentioned, their way of working is to include recommended actions as well, which, which, which actually you know, certainly assists us on our journey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if this is happening, then, well, certainly in Cambridge, and I don't know about the other two councils, that's in the internal audit report. It reflects on the advice they've given. And I think it'd be worth looking at the issue of ICT, for instance. Should we have had our internal auditor supporting the development of, say, the ICT system? Um, so that rather than things getting to the end and them not being satisfactory um, because these things hadn't been put in place, um, then, I mean, I think it's worth looking at what's done in the south of the county, really, because um, it, it, it's a very different model from what I can tell from the documentation we've got to... Um, to the approach that RSM are taking. Now, having said that, of course, the internal auditors are actually employees of the three councils. So they are on site 24-7, um, if you like. So there are those sort of opportunities for bumping into people in the corridor, et cetera, which having RSM doesn't have. So I, I think um, it, it's worth considering. So we're, we're a bit more proactive as we develop new systems rather than waiting for RSM to mark us out of 10 once things are up and running. And so I think from an internal audit perspective, obviously we need to be independent. So there's getting that right balance between actually helping you as you go on your journey and having the independence. Um, but from my own experience and the clients I work with, so for example, where they've been implementing a new finance system, as an internal auditor, I have sat on that project board as they're going on that journey with them to make sure the right controls are being built into those systems, acknowledging that the client will develop what they want to do, but just with my internal audit hat on. So that is something we can do as systems are being developed, having that check and challenge are the right controls being built in, and is something we do do elsewhere. So I'm more than happy to to um, explore that with you as and when required. So, Chair, can we send that as a recommendation from this committee in some way so that um, it, it does go back up the chain as well? I don't know, into Robert or whoever is responsible. Yep, absolutely. So if we're going to take as, as, as part of this decision that there will be um, in your formulation um, uh, in, engaging the internal auditor in um, scoping activity and support to um, change projects, I think we'll, quite, we'll sort of nail it down, but we'll certainly, I think, I think it's a very, very helpful um, suggestion um, uh, as part of embedding RSM into the sort of working but, but, not uh, uh, but also that very important point that RSB made, they are independent scrutiny of the organisation. So the balance between giving advice uh, 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 and, and um, keeping the clarity of independence. Yeah. 
is something we have to also keep in mind. As RSM said, you know, we don't have to take the advice if you like. So it's it's a separate operation if you like, and then ultimately whatever we decide to do is then audited. For, is it so it's not internal audit if you like. It's it's a consultancy in terms of how we develop. Okay, thank thank you very much. I think I'm we're happy. I'll draw that item to a close. Some very good points came up in debate, which I'm sure we'll capture in a minute, particularly the insight that um, RSM gave us to how they reach an audit opinion. So, our next item is the um, paper on trading companies um, and which Robert Parking will present. Um, we, uh, for the record, we could just note that we did have an informal session prior to this meeting so that uh, we were better prepared for this, this new and important subject that we're looking at. Um, and our task is to comment Rec uh, and recommend any changes um, in terms of reference of the committee in relation to trading companies with the combined authority. So, Robert, are you, are you introducing? Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, members, um, yeah, following on from our development session, um, this paper is, is seeking to provide you with a draft set of terms of reference in relation to the uh, review and assessment of, of the uh, overall approach to um, uh, trading companies in the context of audit and governance. Um, the paper refers you at part two to the terms of reference for the committee, which is to review and scrutinise the authorities' financial affairs, um, uh, risk assessment, internal control and corporate governance arrangements, economy efficiency and effectiveness with which um, resources are used and making reports and recommendations to the combined authority board uh, in relation to those and also uh, a, an obligation around standards of conduct. Um, so you're being presented with a paper which is inviting you to review um, a set of proposed terms of reference that seek to um, to empower or describe this committee's role in looking over the arrangements that are in place for the subsidiary companies of the combined authority. Um, slightly more complex picture than just an internal department in the, a, an external company has autonomy, it's a separate legal entity, um, and it, it is a shareholder function <clears throat> to insist as it were, and to, to check upon the um, effectiveness of, of overall of a, of a company's operation, whether it's delivering um, its mandate, whether it's uh, it's being run effectively. So this committee's kind of operating at a remove in, in just looking over how these things are delivered. There is considerable value in this, however, even though it's at operating at a slight remove, um, and uh, reports that are referred to in the paper of the experience of, of, of local authorities um, indicates that the, there are significant benefits um, of committees such as this being satisfied as to the effectiveness of the overall arrangements. Um, so happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Robert, thank you for that. And the proposals look extremely com comprehensive. Just for my benefit, can you confirm that if we agree these terms of reference, they will be formally adopted by the individual companies and the, the board such that they recognize the powers that we have to review these sort of elements? Um, and we heard earlier about the importance of ensuring the board are made up of people with the right skills. Um, I'm assuming that that's covered within one or other of, of these. And the final comment is if the board decides to set up new uh, companies, is that something which they require our approval to or comment on? 
uh, would it be helpful for us to suggest areas that they should be considering having new companies in order to transfer the risk from the authority to a company or whatever they might be doing. So a, a few comments, but overall I'm in favour of the, the uh, terms of reference as you've described them. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're presenting these as a set of terms of reference for this committee to help describe to itself its role in relation to companies falling within the overall terms of reference of the committee. What we can do, of course, is is present these terms of reference up to the combined authority board to have them enshrined in the constitution. The benefit of that would be, of course, that as shareholder, it then could take the follow on action of, 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 of as it were, transmitting those obligations or having a compact that those obligations be respected by the companies. So I think there's benefit in adding that into this, um, actually. And I think, I think there's an opportunity there if, if this committee is interested in developing it further to have um, in relation to this, and again, it would be subject because the, the combined authority board function that's exercised a role in um, reviewing the audit and, audit and governance arrangements of proposed companies. So those are all within the gift of this committee to seek to have resolved today. So that's, a reckon, that's actually to have these, as it were, hardwired into the constitution to go to the board to involve the board in, in taking a view and supporting it and, there, and thereby transmitting them onto the companies. Um, because otherwise, the, the, the way it would work is that you rely upon your, as a committee, power to make reports and recommendations to the board. And I think you'd be doing that in any instance, but it would follow on from specific reviews. So it may be that we want to sort of double, um, you know, um, belt and braces it by sending it to the board, having it put into the constitution and then having something in there that says, in relation to proposed um, the establishment of companies to for, 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 the, for the audit and governance committee to comment upon the um, the proposed internal arrangements. Thanks, Joe. So, and we've got both um, Croydon and Nottingham as examples to look at. But from reading the report for both those organisations. Lots of the issues were baked in when they were originally set up, which was really down to the members of the council um, not actually paying too much attention, I think it says <laughs> in the report, and um, sort of nodding it through. So we will have no role in terms of that stage, as far as I know, in how they're set up. Um, for instance, and their procedures and all those sort of things. It, we, we, I'm not saying we have to pick up the pieces, but we, we, we have to cope with what, what's given. So I think there may, may be situations, perhaps none of our companies, but there may be situations where they've been set up in such a way um, that um, they can't actually deliver. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in... Um, in the examples that have been used, not necessarily helping us in understanding what the challenges are for us. Um, and, and as a direct question, um, and we did talk this in the briefing session. Um, so on the terms of reference 3.1, it says arrangements are in place in all shareholder agreements for reserve matters to be considered by the combined authority board. Um, so, we certainly need, as we discussed earlier, a lot more information about those sort of matters and uh, when, when we start doing our work on these, so we fully understand what is in effect devolved, <laughs> the operating or trading company and, and what the CPA, CPCA um, is responsible for, but I'm pleased that we're moving forward on this. It's something that's vexing me in Cambridge as well um, as to how we do it. And I think uh, all local authorities are, are looking very intently at how they handle this sort of thing. So thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, so, uh, so, so looking at reading over the paper on um, uh, the rapid review at, at Croydon. I think I think you're right that there is, to an extent, a uh, 
that there's a, an implicate there's a follow-on set of consequences from the way in which that shareholder company relationship is set up in the first instance but it's also i think to do with looking at the Croydon report finance, various decisions around finances etc um so so there is a steady state role as well and um, and for me you know it, it, it's we haven't we, we could have spent a, a lot of time trying to really intricately describe the role of an audit committee in relation to a, a, a separated out company i think that might have done a violence to the possible to, to the to the benefits as it were of discovering an effective relationship and doing so in sort of hand in hand with with the way that the companies work the way that the board wants to run things but still benefit from a look in um, and i think as you also say on 3.1 yeah the companies um, are all slightly different. They're all bespoke. They have slightly different control relationships. Some of them don't have a full internal audit function because they're, for example, at the moment not trading. So, so there is a journey to go on to sort of learn where they are and how things are developing. But it, but it seems to me that having a core acceptance and understanding that this committee has a role in in being satisfied as the to the overall relationship just promotes good governance in general terms and there may be very specific things that it comes out with as it goes through its work so if we think that um, the, the way it's been set up is not correct if you like um its relationship with the cpca board or whatever it happens to be how um, easy would it be to, um, to change the relationship? Um, I, I don't know how these have been set up and how easy it would be, for instance, to change the relationship if we, if we thought it wasn't correct. I, I'm not sure that is actually within our gift uh, because this is the, the our duty is are the controls robust and in place if management have decided to do things in a different way to what one personally might have done it if one was doing it oneself that isn't really within the audit committee this is overview and scrutiny um so, sorry so, if, I, if i can just come back on that because there, there is a chain of command or whatever you want to call it if you like so you've got cpca you've got a trading company if we don't think the way those two join together, if you like, um, is correct, then uh, are there opportunities to change them? Uh, the nuances of the English language, I think. I think our, our view is to, if we are unhappy with the governance arrangements and the control arrangements, then it's wholly in our gift. If we don't like the way it's been set up, it's not in our gift. Uh, thank you, Joan. I fully support the suggested terms of reference, um, coupled with the idea that's come from Graham and Robert about progressing this with, with the board and getting into the constitution. It does lead me on to a couple of other things, though. Um, not that it would fall into terms of reference, but we need to build into the work program when we're actually going to look at the information that we're saying we need to look at it. so we need to get that in the in the work program and um, just on, on on angle holdings and uh, angle developments east limited being the sad individual i am i read the board papers and it looks to me like the board is pulling out of affordable housing full stop uh, in actually being a provider of affordable housing which then begs the question do we still need, does the board think that there is still a need for Angle Development East Limited? And if it doesn't, does it therefore still see the need for Angle Holdings Limited? Can we ask the board to consider that? I think that's on thin ice too, given our role. Um, and I, I, I don't think this is a territory that we should trespass in, given our central purpose. Notwithstanding any underlying logic to your comments. I've made my point. <laughs> and I'll come back to the, uh, where we, what we do next in the, in the work plan. Uh, Ian Thank you. 
Um, I mean, the, the, the purpose of these trading companies is to deliver. And as, as much as they're set up to protect the interests of the CPCA, they're also there to work with partners to make this so it works. And we mustn't interfere too much in the, in, in the workings of the individual companies. Um, you know, we are an audit and governance committee. Audit is all history. Um, we meet four times a year. We're three months away if we get reports coming in to us that state that there is troubles ahead, then we have a duty to respond to that. When it comes down to saying how we set these companies up, um, I'm certainly not qualified to say how a company is set up. We very, very much go with the reports that are in front of us. We, we set an investment board up here in, in Finland and we very much went on the, the advice of officers to get that right. Um, and you can't, in some cases, you can foresee a problem coming, but equally, we can't interfere in the running of the CPCA or in these subsidiary companies either, because they have to be allowed to function and do their job, which is, is and their job is, is to deliver and work with partners. And we cannot interfere too much in the setting up. And at some point, we have to accept the experts, because all of us on this side of the, of the fence are elected. We're not specialists in our field. We rely on people on the other side of the fence to bring their expertise and, and, and experience to, to advise us. Um, if we see it's going wrong, then we step in. But we have to take the advice of the experts, the, the officers, to tell us that this is the correct procedure for this. We can question it. But I, I think that you know, maybe we're going a little bit too bogged down in, in the detail of, of governance here, and we've got to allow these companies to flourish. And if we put too much restriction on that, that will slow delivery up, and it will also hinder the way that company functions. We can't micromanage this from the top down. That is not what this, the, the, the purpose of these companies are, and it is the purpose that is the important part of this. Thank you, Ian. That's very helpful. Thank you, Chairman. I'm a bit nervous about these terms of reference because given our relationship of, uh, with trading companies, we've got in these terms of refer reference to ensure the internal controls and risk management related blah, 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 to ensure how we're going to do that. And if we can't, are we setting ourselves up as a committee to fail? Could I now comment, please? Because um, you have moved right into where I wanted to be at before we concluded this one. We haven't discussed it. All my life, I have been nervous about insure as a word. Um, and when we look at um, the failings of elsewhere, terms of reference where we were responsible as a non executive. Boarding Governance Committee for ensuring things that went wrong is, um, is, is not an appropriate way of expressing the oversight of governance and scrutiny. Um, and, and I think it. Uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, how many bullet points are there? To H, I. That's an awful lot of bullet points. Um, with a lot of insurance in. Uh, and, and I wonder if com members are comfortable with, with, the, with that sort of liability that goes with the word of insurance. Uh, and I would commend that we shouldn't have insurance, that we should find other ways in which we are providing that oversight and that assurance for the combined authority in a way which does not um, get our long screwdriver into how a business which has its own fiduciary duties and, and laws uh, to, to it. So I would uh, suggest, uh, if, if members are willing, that I ask um, officers to relook at the wording and the number of points to see if we could have a better form of words which aligns with our function and doesn't cross thread with others. Would people be happy? I mean, that comes back to the next meeting when we will be taking the constitution. 
because I think members are happy with the essence of the things that we should be helping to provide assurance with. Robert, have we not discussed this? Um, no, we haven't. It's, it, so, so some very important points there um, uh, are made, Councillor Benny, Councillor Ball, about the nature of the control relationship between this committee and the companies. It is operating at a remove. Um, so words like ensure don't, um, don't, I don't think that they actually, looking back at this again, following that discussion, they don't, they don't adequately, I think, describe the nuance of the relationship, which is that it, it has a role in being satisfied overall, that things are being examined, looked at. Um, but of course, it can't direct because of that relationship, that there is a separation there. Sorry. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the gaps, of course, is that um, they potentially don't have their own internal audit functions. And I guess that's what we really need. I mean, for instance, um, the Stanford County have, as I say, shared services in various places, and the assurance comes from the internal audit of the, um, the shared service. Um, and we, say, in Cambridge or Stanford County or Hunter, Huntingdonshire, don't have to um, perform the internal audit function. And there is a danger here that we are not making sure that they've got the right sort of internal audit, if you like, et cetera, to give us assurance that we're going in to do that work. Uh, and I, I think it's very important, but I don't think that that's our role is to get in. I think there's and I think we might need more advice on this because, because um, in, my, in one of my other parts of life, after a certain, at a certain threshold of turnover, there's a requirement for internal audit within a company. Or, uh, uh, but uh, unless others would like to comment, I don't think uh, whether they do it or do not, as long as it is legal and we, and we don't have any observations on the governance relationships between the CPCA and the company, and it is legal, I would have thought spreading beyond that would be a bit tricky. Yeah, it's, my, my perception is, is that this committee is, is, in relation to the trading companies, is almost arm's length, hands off, <laughs> because anything we, review or promote is, is to go to the CPCA board because they have ownership of the trading companies. And this committee hears representation from the chief executive of the CPCA and receives the accounts of the CPCA, but will not receive any observations from executives of the trading companies or the trading companies' accounts. So I fail to see how we can therefore direct when we don't have the information coming direct to ourselves, it would come via the CPCA board. And that, that, that causes me a bit, a bit of a concern, is that, that impression in my mind of arm's length hands off. You're going to give input, but actually you're giving input to the board on what they can then do to the individual trading companies. Thank you, Tony. I think that was a very good description. It was... Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, you partly covered this, um, but I mean, if Robert could uh, clarify this, um, I mean, I've, I've had a limited company myself, and when your turnover goes over a certain amount, they have to have audited accounts. Um, if they go over a certain size again, they have to be audited by external auditors as well. And we were told earlier this morning that some of the companies we've got are non-trading companies, and therefore they won't fall into the remit of having accounts that need to be audited internally or externally. So um, I think they. The accounts will certainly be made public. All limited companies' accounts are public documents, um, and they should come back certainly to the CPCA board. Whether they need to come back to us to be looked at, um, I don't know whether that is a, a remit for this this particular committee, but I would say not uh, myself. But uh, you know, if the, if the committee wants to discuss this, because this is micromanaging of a company that has been set up to, to do a job. Um, I have concerns that we may be delving too deeply into this to interfere. Yeah, I, I, I don't mind this going back 
to see whether some of these insurers should be reviewed or strive to insure or something similar. But if we're not insuring it, then I would like to know who was going to insure. Because I, I, I think that these trading companies are so important in delivery that we should be keeping an eye on what was going on. And if we're not doing it through these terms of reference, because we're at hands off, don't want you to micromanage, then I'd like to be reassured as to who is looking at it. Uh, I don't have a problem with the, the number of items because I think that's then a, a comprehensive list of the expectations that both the board and the authority and the individual companies should have of what we expect to do. I think it's been very, very useful and it shows how complex it is to make sure that we stay within our ambit, but also provide that oversight. Um, and I'm not sure, um, given the nature of the debate, uh, that we will be necessarily ready for the constitution review when we next look at this. But I don't see that this is, speed of advance is less important than trying to get it right so that, we, that, that reflects uh, many of the comments that have been made. So could I ask officers to come back to us with a different uh, or a set of wording which covers these elements which we're all very keen for in a way that respects our role and the place that we have vis-a-vis -vis the combined authority. Mike. I mean, we're all struggling on this across the whole area, I'm sure, with, with how we're going to do it, uh, auditing of trading companies. And I just wonder if, you know, there's value in getting some outside advice, some of the government's scrutiny or, or, or whatever, to help all the counties, um, councils and at CPCA on this. I mean, so I, just... I, I don't think we should be reinventing the wheel this is all fairly new territory, and uh, I'm not quite sure we've got the expertise internally to um, to fully address this. And we've obviously swum around a bit today in terms of no, but at it, one stage liking it, and then another stage saying, "Well, hang on, okay. what's this all about?" I I um, I think we should ask officers to look at that. I I, I think the speed of advance is not the issue here it's understanding this and, and and i would ask you to come back to the next meeting having perhaps reached out to some of the other constituent councils to see there would be some value uh either just by sharing experiences or whether a get together or some uh, brainstorming type um uh, with advice would help and i and it seems to me that the essence of what we're trying to do in, in getting our government's oversight here is exactly to answer that regard about knowing who is doing what to whom. Um, uh, uh, because we can then see are the controls in place at a level that are appropriate for the CPA. Um, and then after that, or at the same time, we need some advice on how we first ask internal audit to look at this, do they take a one company as an example and, and, and look at all the government's controls and come back to us, or is there some different way? So I think that's three things. The wording to be uh, more, more in line with our role and the, of the relationship between us and the CPA uh, board. The, benefit value uh, feedback on taking a wider view as a, 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 and sharing the experiences of others and an insight into how we the next steps and what um, where we would like internal audit to cast uh, their first um, look are we happy with that as a summation of a it's a very it is so important to uh, not just the CPSCA board, but the whole uh, 
issue of how you balance the public sector role with the purpose of having companies which are able to uh, be fleet of foot and produce. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for all this. And I, I think if this takes more time, then a short update at the next meeting will do if that's appropriate. On the other hand, it would be nice if you could come back with some of those questions answered. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, Right, having given Robert Parkin all that to do, uh, we're now going to look at the one cam referral, which Robert will introduce, and we are going to be asked to consider, comment, and agree the, the approach, and uh, invite the internal auditor to undertake a review. Uh, Robert, thank you. Yeah, so this is actually clear from the paper. Um, Chair of the Board's uh, committee was approached with a request that uh, an audit review take place in relation to the decisions to date, um, such as they are to suspend activity on the OneCam project. Um, and um, in order to look at this um, through the prism of audit, um, a discussion has taken place with RSM about the scope. Uh, they have fed back to us with a description um, in that sets out in the paper as to the scope. Um, uh, and we've worked with them on that. Um, there's a description there about methodology as well. And, and this paper is inviting the committee to comment on that scope um, specifically, and then to invite the auditor to commence work. Um, as we know at the moment, there isn't a formal process of reference set out in the constitution. Um, there's a later paper in this report that's looking to have one enshrined, um, but discussions have taken place with the chair who was minded to um, allow that this, this be looked at by the internal auditor, chair. Um, I'm, I welcome this, um, but I've got a, um, a question really about why um, the authority of the board and the executive of one cam is is excluded following on from the various conversations we've had um, i mean could the board of directors of one cam say no we're not going to close down for instance because they're a uh, you know they're in charge of one cam um, so i just wonder why this has been excluded Sorry, trying to understand by exclusion. It says it's outside of scope. Sorry, Robert. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to get the text of the. Page 52. Right, OK. Um, so I mean, essentially, for me, looking at what this is going to will entail is, is a description of essentially the roles and responsibilities. Um, it, it, it's inevitably there is going to be some comment on the roles of the respective parties as to closure. Um, I think maybe it would be better to describe there the, the substantive decisions themselves um, are outside the scope. Actually, of course, the role of, of, of each and their power to make decisions is, is for me, something that um, really should be in scope so that's perhaps not not sufficiently clear there it probably should say that uh, you know the the decision itself is of course a matter for for those parties but their role is actually at the core of this and that's that's a role that that, that needs to be examined as to power um so i take that point that that's that that doesn't seem to reflect that when we say out that it's outside the scope to say that the authority of those parties i think that's 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 not quite right actually it's, it's more about the, the any decision of that actually the authority and power is something that that, that would warrant comment i'd expect in, a, in an audit review so is that the decisions made are outside the scope of the review because the review is about where the decisions were made within the proper context. Is that, is that the issue? Well, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any objection to this this uh, review going ahead. I mean, I, I can only recall with the previous mayor that there were occasions when he made decisions independent of the board because he had the competent authority that was detailed within the, the context of the CPCA to make those decisions independently. I certainly came up. Thank you. And I, I mean, I think this is what this is all about. Was it whatever the decisions were, were they made in a competent way? Maybe the one other occasion this committee has asked for work to be done, that was two or three years ago. Uh, that was the question. Was was it proper in, in the terms of the mandate and the law, not about whether it was wise? Um, yeah, thank you, Jed. Um, two questions. One, I don't understand the third bullet of the terms of reference about is there any spend stroke spending commitment from the combined authority itself on the CAM program or has it all been directed through one CAM limited? Um, I'm not, I, I don't understand this. what significance of that is and maybe what we should be trying to understand is how much money has been in quotes wasted by um, the abortive expenditure to date and I, I don't think that's covered and then the second question is um, what's the time scale for this review because clearly that needs potentially to feed into the review of the constitution thank you um, last part time timetable that we'd look to have this instructed um, in you know following this meeting essentially and I think it would be a, uh, something that's sort of six, again a six to eight week piece of work at most um, decisions as to uh, a report on, on expenditure I think they need, probably need to reflect on whether that's something better for overview and scrutiny rather than this committee but I'll leave that to the chair to, to lead on as, as the point on spending from the combined authority itself well the combined authority is, is well, I don't want to get into too much into the substance of it, but essentially the combined authority is the, is the shareholder and has, has provided the funds. So I guess that question is looking at whether um, there are certain things that the combined authority contracted and then one can paid combined authority for rather than directly outwards. And that's, that's not an unusual arrangement, but this would, would, would provide a description of that. I don't know if John also wants to supplement that with anything. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good question about what um, what that um, that review point actually means because, it, because the whole of the, the CAM, um, the cost of the development of the CAM to date has come through the combined authorities funding anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I think it probably just needs to clarify exactly what um, what the concern is that, that that point is trying to address. But, um, but is, it, is, is the point not, is this a governance issue or not? Well, it's, it, it, it's both understanding what that point was supposed to mean, but also um, how much, it, whether, as Robert is suggesting, it's overview and scrutiny's responsibility to understand about the money spent, which will now be stopped and therefore, in quotes, could be regarded as wasted. Um, or is that something which could usefully be provided as part of this review? And it may be that the the um, review was being requested to look into the um, the mayor's action in cancelling it, and wasn't concerned about the cost of the project. Um, the only reason that this would be in here, if you like, would be that the, the mayor couldn't make the decision because of the spending commitments, which I think doesn't make sense to me. So I would say take that bullet point. I really mean, and obviously there's always consequences to staff and other commitments and there's a wrapping up process isn't it for, for closing these that things down but i don't see it as part of the scope of this uh, thank you mike are people happy to take that point out as proposed by mike keep it clean right that's a decision we don't want that bullet point in there just, so just to clarify, are we saying that, that, that issues around money are not uh, uh, on this project are not a matter for this committee and it's for overview and scrutiny to I'm investigate? Not, so I'm not saying about the other world. I'm just saying this isn't about governance. 
it is not, how I took the recommendation. It's not part of the decision process, um, you know, because the decision is whether the mayor had the power. Yeah. Uh, and the financial side, is, is, as far as I'm concerned, not part of that. We're talking about the constitution, who can make decisions. And, and, and unless there is something, and I'd have well, no then it will, it will, if they did, if if actions were beyond their powers, that would come out regardless of what the issue was, which could be related to a financial limit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are we happy? Uh, are we happy to delete as recommended by Mike uh, uh, that sentence, and that we ask officers just to the the, the exclusion bit is about the decisions, not about. The authorities, because it's it's the exercise of authority within the governance framework, which we're interested in. I mean, it's, on that basis, are we happy to proceed without delay? Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes. Because yes. yes. you need a pause for thought. No, 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 no. Because you... we'll do what we're told to. All right. Okay. Um, well, we made a decision. Not for the moment. Um, good, thank you very much for that. Now we're um, coming on to item eight, which Robert Parkin has, has a pause for breath before he presents it, uh, and it's about the business board meetings. And we are um, to note and note and then recommend that the combined authority board approve the proposed format. Yes, yeah, so this, this is a matter which um, has been through this committee initiated a suggestion to um, switch the presumption from being uh, meetings being in private to meetings as it were being in public subject to the um, determination of the chair of, of the board, the business board. Um, so uh, the matter uh, has been um, back to the business board, I believe there's uh, uh, some discussions that are taking place. The business board has agreed to um, uh, to its constitution being changed in line with the recommendation. Um, and as this is a, yeah, effectively a change to the constitutional documents, the combined authority it comes back to this committee. We can then then go on, go back onto the combined authority board for 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 for, for, for consideration. The bare bones is that uh, the uh, the chair of the business, sorry, the business board itself has agreed to um, this change, which is a, um, a switch of the presumption from uh, this, uh, meetings to be held in, in public, um, <coughs> subject to that determination by the chair. So it's very clear um, for us and the overview and scrutiny in the board and, and the operational committees um, under what criteria people could be excluded from the meeting and it's enshrined in legislation really I, i'm not clear because there will obviously be for instance commercial decisions which might mean that uh, the public are excluded um, now it may be the business board are not subject to um, the same requirements as, as we are um but is there going to be any sort of guidance um so we've got some sort of idea of when the chair might might do this i, I think we remember this was in the response to a proposal made by this committee last year uh and it's a powerful a powerful feedback loop that whilst it caused some debate recommendation has been accepted. Um, we made no recommendations regarding procedures or advice. We just, uh, uh, that's for others. No, it was just a question really in terms of, as the chair said, anything of the business board, for instance, are they going to have any internal guidance or? Um, I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see how it develops. I, I, I am not privy to any guidance. Is, is this exactly the same? wording in, as in the constitution for the authority itself or other committees. No, um, and, and I don't understand why it isn't because um, the, the general phrase in 2.1 talks about ex except when the chair deemed there were reasons of confidentiality not to do so. And now it's saying and um, it'll be in the public unless determined otherwise by the chair. 
and that may or may not include confidentiality but it may be if we get a different uh, business board chair a whim of the business board chair and i personally don't find it very satisfactory that it's not the same as the authority itself and it's not specifically about where there were reasons of confidentiality confidentiality not to do so i appreciate john that you've worked very hard on this and you've tried to come to some sort of compromise but it, it still doesn't seem to achieve what we were trying to achieve which was everything should be in public unless there is a really 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 good reason not to uh, I, I thought the wording was almost exactly the same but i take advice well the business board is, the, other way around. The, the, the business board is, is not a committee of, uh, it's certainly not a meeting of the a local authority it's not subject to the um, 72 acts and, and and exemptions in in the same format um and and uh, the stuff of its business is is inevitably um around commercial endeavor um and is often at a uh, stage in uh, in in in, the, in in for example projects and and uh, endeavor wherein sensitivity and commercial sensitivity is a is a, is an imperative um and a justifiable one to observe um so it's a, it's a special setting i'd say um which is why historically these um environments tend to 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 do much of their business in private and i, th I think it, it's i think it, it i think it's um it's it's run um you know um effectively across the country as, as, as an environment where commercial sensitivity is handled and it's and it's done so privately i think as i say it's a special case it's different um we don't need to reflect the um wider legislation because it doesn't apply um and this amendment which has been um you know debated and agreed at length business board um and has been subject to discussions for me captures um what was intended which is which is the presumption that it allows that um you know commercial confidentiality will trump and that that was what we were asked to do we we're asked to switch the presumption and, and not to import um detailed um protocol as to how that's going to be applied so um i feel chair that we've we've done that we've gone through all these discussions and we've brought them back we're going to try and go further then um we'll need to accept that it's going to be a, a longer process and it may be that actually what we do is we uh, look at this and see how it how it plays. Uh, I think we should listen to Robert Parkin. Um, I could just say that uh, when I met um, over coffee with the chair of the business board, he was quite um, open about anybody from this committee wishing to go and attend a meeting. Um, uh, and and I am personally pleased that the board, the business board, was able to come to the decision that it's come. And I think um, where we are at the moment is probably an appropriate place, unless in future no concerns are raised. But I extend that invitation if anybody would like to attend a meeting in the business board, if they will let me know. And I'll make sure that um, people go along because he, the, 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 he's very anxious that people shouldn't think there's anything amiss. In this. So this is a lack of normal intents and purposes. This is the, if we actually look elsewhere in the country to see what premises were wrong. I've no idea. This came out of a very uh, strong debate within this committee. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, what goes on elsewhere, this, this was what this committee asked the business board to consider and, they, and CPCA board to consider. I know for a fact that there are different things, different bits around the country. Some reps meet entirely in private. It's standard practice that anything that's commercial would be behind closed doors. I think they've responded to what we asked them to do. Then let's move on. Um, Before you move on, are we going to vote on that? 
Well, unless people want to vote, which has been our habit. I'm afraid I would like to vote against it. Okay, well then we will have a vote, please. Those in favour? Those against? Um, we've done now. We're on to item nine. Vote, vote program um, and this flows from previous papers and discussions we've had in how we keep an eye on the work program and, and align it with things that are coming ahead and uh, satisfy ourselves whether or not uh, what's going on is takes account of the risks or is aligned with the risks. Robert. Thank you, Chair. So um, the report is is uh, our usual work program report, which uh, notes the current work program. Um, it, it discusses, it introduces the top five risks. That was a request to bring um, to this committee. Uh, and there's also a, a, a request that the committee consider whether it would like to hold an informal session to receive a horizon scanning update from the directors. Um, as well, there is a um, there is a an invitation to um, examine a change to the terms of reference or the constitution documents rather than the terms of reference. Actually, it's it is uh, it is it is to bring in a suggested change to the constitution to allow for reference to matters of matters to this committee um, by um, the by the uh, combined authority. Uh, board, um, basically, and, and, and that is that is that is a mechanism whereby um, uh, another board can, uh, another committee board setting, the combined authority board can make a formal reference to this committee. So, members are being asked to uh, review those matters and to consider the, uh, the proposed change to the, um, an introduction of a referral process. Any comments? On C, which is discussed the top five risks, um, I'm not really sure what, what we are trying to achieve there and what the outcome or output would be. Um, to me, top five risks do give an opportunity to um, sort of guide the internal auditors, for instance, because maybe there is a, an issue with the way these things have been run to so the controls are wrong, for instance. Um, I mean, I, I fully understand that um, all that's going on in this, the moment in terms of supply chain, et cetera, might be the cause, but I think it's important that um, the top five risks are an indication that something's gone wrong. And in certain cases, the internal auditors perhaps should be engaged um, on that. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I've raised the issue of um, um, the housing program in, in the past. And, uh, you know, the scoring for that to me was incorrect, for instance. Um, and it should have been even higher, to be honest. But, um, you know, I think this should be a, there should be a trigger to help us guide in terms of what internal audit should be doing. But, and, I, and this might be one of the vehicles, but I'm not quite sure what else we're going to do when we look at this risk register. Uh, I, I think you encapsulated it. Was, it came out of a discussion that we should, in the texture of an organisation which we're at arm's length from, we should have some insights as to what they're wrestling with. And that may or may not lead us to the conclusion when we, that we need some work to be done. And it, I didn't see it any more than that. I, I, I would, I, I don't think one can say that because of things are top risk, something's gone wrong. Some things are to do with internal management. I think the pandemic, I don't think we could say anything's gone wrong uh, from the CPA's organizational point of view. So there's a balance of external risks, which are they managing them satisfactorily? Uh, or is it a threat which is so substantial, which is how I see it. It's just part of the tapestry 
which we ask for. Now, if we don't want to continue with it, then that's why I'm, I'm at the officers are at the behest of members. So my question, Chair, was I'm not saying we shouldn't have this list, but it's not clear from C what we're meant to be doing with it, really. It's, it's just, and I think we have commented in the past, perhaps, um, well, why is that 5-2? Why isn't it 5-3, if you like? I don't think that's our role. Our role is, is to make sure that um, um, the audit is looking at um, potential issues in terms of controls and, and procedures. And this may be one way to help guide us, because we have talked in the past about the fact that we're not very close to how we combine authority work. Um, so it is very difficult for us to judge where resources should be put. I think that's exactly right. I saw, I saw this coming out of a wish to give us another way of looking into the prison. Uh, um, and if we, we find after a while it's not helpful, members, perhaps you want to, we can remove it. But this is the first time we've done this, I think. Yeah, so the idea, I think, is to um, listen. The risk register is, is, is that the risk register starts to take a, a central um, place, plus we have, as, as is proposed in here, that reference ability um, that, that, that provides the committee and, and the internal auditor with um, a sense of, of what may be key issues to be looked at. As, as the chair has indicated, some of the risks may not be matters around um, that essentially an audit examination would assist on, but, but, it, but it's another um, angle that, that may assist this committee in being satisfied that the work program is comprehensive enough um, uh, or, or, or focused properly um, is it's, it's just, it's just, just meant to be a tool for that end. If I can then just come back, because I, I, as you know, Chair, I, I was interested in 21 being pursued and it's not being pursued at the moment. I think it should be pursued in terms of um, looking at the um, procedures uh, of the combined authority. I know certainly, I don't even know if it, there is a member of the protocol, but I know there was a breakdown at one stage. And I also know that um, one of the big issues was the uh, agreement with MHCLG, mm -hmm. um, the business case was not followed through. So I think those are the reasons why it's um, the government unhappy with the performance on the housing programme. And uh, I think we need to, uh, that would be something that we should be looking at. I mean, we have, you and I have discussed this offline uh, uh, when we first met each other. Um, and there's the question of were the processes right or was the decision making wrong? Um, and, uh, um, and my interpretation of it is that this is still developing, but it was more about the decision making than the governance. But all members are able to put forward uh, suggestions to colleagues if they would like this moved up the agenda. Um, I think it would be best, though, to do that when we got it in a context like the Horizon Scanning meeting, um, or when we are formally reviewing internal audit work plan. So there is just a supplement that obviously earlier on this agenda was a proposal to have that Horizon Scanning session with directors, and it may be that areas where more information is sought or uh, further thinking is sought that, that you could have that session and develop thoughts there. Sorry, I was just, I was just, whilst we were talking, I'm just looking back at one of the, the earlier papers, um, which has got the progress against the internal audit plan, and looking to see where those were um, featured in there. I think there is, is possibly a, certainly there's the scope to, to review the, the audit plan in light of um, some of those emerging risks. And when would we do in the after the horizon scanning? Sorry, we would. When will the horizon scanning take place? Um, and when was that envisaged for?
No, it can't be on. Not meeting in October. No, it's oh, is it going to be a special high rise and scanning session? I lost sight of that. Do members know about this? And that's the, what's before us today. I, I agree we should do horizon scanning. Uh, personally, I prefer to do it face to face rather than virtually because I think that's perhaps such an important thing. Uh, the constitution being updated on matters about that and trying to understand it, I don't have a problem doing that virtually. But okay. horizon scanning, personally, I think would be difficult. But do, do I? Do I take it this agreement that we should have a horizon scanning meeting with the directors and we, this be a special session at some time in October subject to programming? And that the preference is to do it a, a, a real meeting? Or could we do a hybrid meeting? Well, the directors would be there, but the members could perhaps tune in. For those who didn't want to be in the room, couldn't be in the room. I'm trying to make this up as I go along. Mm -hmm. I prefer that approach. Um, Hybrid. With the directors. Because I'm, I'm not sure I agree with where it needs to be done. Okay. Face to face, because if if what we're getting in this horizon scanning document is directors presenting to us what they. What they're saying. They're Are there that. any other views about the format? Any? I'm trying to gauge where we are. I would prefer a, a, a virtual meeting rather than a face-to-face -face one. Just, just from a time management perspective, really. Others? Uh, <clears throat> I'd prefer face-to-face -face as well, Trevor. So, shall we encourage hybridity? Um, and ask the officers to arrange it as soon as we can get a reasonable membership. Because I know it's already it's important that we do these things, but trying to find spaces in the busy diaries of the members is a challenge. John, uh, the, uh, the 28th of October has already been suggested. No, no, no. Uh, I'll come back. That was a that's about the constitution. Couldn't we do both on the same time? Well, they're virtual, the 28th of October. It's the week of the 10th. Well, if we're going to do it as a hybrid. Okay. I don't um, know. You're, let's just go back. You introduced, at the, I was unaware, or had my mind had slipped on those dates at the bottom of this paper, the 28th week commencing the 28th of October uh, for an informal online session for on the constitution about an hour and a special meeting on the constitution on the 12th of november when i discussed it with officers this morning providing we have a successful um uh, uh, and by that i mean a good turnout for an informal online session to open our minds to the issues for the constitution we should be able to deal with the business in our next programmed meeting but I've also asked officers, last year we had a special meeting. And maybe my sense is wrong, but I've, I've, I've been reluctant to create special meeting days that weren't in the programme because of the councils having to manage their uh, duties and responsibilities. So what I have asked is that uh, if there's a feeling that for next year we need a full meeting devoted to the constitution. It should go into the civic year planning at the beginning. Um, so all that was intended by those dates is uh, an informal session on the on in the week commencing the twenty eighth on the constitution. And I think we'll stick with the hybridity. May and can come out at the same time. And if the twenty eighth that week works, then we can do it. But I suspect that will be more diaries to be knitted with the directors. It might take a bit longer to, to find a, um, 
a suitable date. I might be wrong, but I think we should give the latitude to officers uh, to do it as soon as possible, but bearing in mind other pressures. We've been, um, it's quarter past 12. Um, we've got two items to do to people. Want to, we've been at it for two and a quarter hours. Do we want five minutes break or would we just like to continue? I'm just checking what we're going to do next. The guy will finish this. Okay. Uh, would we like a break or not? Yeah. Okay. So let's just finish this item then and then we'll take a five minute next. Uh, so, Robin, do you want to take us through what we now need to agree, yeah, so, agree well, or not? That's, so, so this, this recommendation before you is to review and agree the updated terms of reference for the committee, which are, are as to references to the committee. Note the current work programme. Um, uh, discuss, as you have, the top five risks and to consider whether uh, to hold an informal session to receive a horizon scanning update. And, and again, there's been a discussion on that with, a, uh, with, with an indication um, that yes, to have one. Um, so, okay. Do we finish? We have done that. Reviewed. No, agreed the updated terms of reference. They are. That's the most, that's the action word, agree. Are we comfortable that we understand what we're being asked to agree? Can you just take us to the page? Yep, so you can pop it up. This is a, it's, it's, a, it's appendix one to the document pack. Page number. Page number, uh, Anna, have you got the page number? Mm -hmm. 63. And are we happy with that, members? Chairman, having not having been at the previous meeting, but that certainly reflects what's in the minutes of the last meeting. So I would say you've already agreed. <laughs> Effectively, that's what was agreed okay. last time. You just asked officers to put it in writing. So can I take it that we have agreed then with that proposed amendment? And we've done the other item. Thank you very much. So we'll have five minutes. Before we lose it. Um, so I would like to request um, a, a, a matter is referred to the committee. So I don't know how I do this when this is um, changed. Do I write to Robert or? But yeah, I think that a request for the monitoring also yeah. with the reasons and the rationale. Thank you very much. It's um, so. 20 past now, five minutes, 25 past.
Thank you. We'll reconvene, having had our leg stretch. Uh, so the next item, uh, represented by a man we all know, Robert Parkin, for his 84th time today, is the Corporate Risk Register, when we're asked to note and review and recommend any changes uh, to the next combined authority board. Yes, yeah, so this is a standing item, uh, members coming back to the committee, which is our, our Corporate Risk Register. Um, and uh, the committee is having uh, it presented to them for comment, review, uh, and the suggestion um, uh, from the committee of any additional commentary or changes. Um, the committee is familiar with the, uh, with the top five risks that came in the last item, and there we've had notified to us from directors some shifts in the risk position um, from those items listed at uh, two, six through to two. Nine. John and I will attempt to answer questions that you may have. Um, otherwise, um, that's all I wanted to say, Chair. Thank you, Chair. On page number 85, there's three items in red. Uh, is it fairly standard, Robert, for those type of items to be in the red zone, or is there anything we need to note or be concerned about? Item 114, 16. Um, so I don't think there's anything necessarily normal about things being read. Um, that they are read as a result of the conditions that sit around them. Um, so in terms of a, a, a narrative on those, we've got the external delivery partners not meeting deadlines due to budget or effects internally. It may be that John Alsop is able to comment on that, that that's a, that's a non-mover at one. Um, and then, uh, as you say, disruption to the operation of the combined authority, that's in relation to um, circumstances. Um, I think that's sorry, we're going to jump around between registers to see the, the attendant narrative. Um, let's do that. 14. I think both 14 and, and 16 relate to COVID. Yeah. So obviously kept under continual review, but and perhaps the prevailing picture is changing. But um, I think those putting together the um, register. Um, clearly of the view that matters were so uncertain that uh, it should remain uh, with that risk profile um, on those two. I don't know if John was able to comment on risk ID one, which is um, uh, really around budget <coughs> external partners. Yes, I think I think um, we are. We've been acutely aware of um, difficulties over the last um, year or so um, with. Um, our partner organisations, the, the, the um, uh, constituent authorities and the financial difficulties that they've all had. Um, and, and, and more recently, um, uh, to, um, I think the, uh, there have been reports to at least two of the constituent councils um, from their own auditors about um, significant difficulties that um, that, um, that the subsidiary councils have, have had and have led to a, a number of, of um, peer reviews and other external reviews. Obviously, there's absolutely no suggestion that there's anything um, that the uh, organisations have, have, have done wrong. It's just the, um, the, uh, the, the, the amount of um, financial commitment against the amount of revenue that is um, that is available to address some of those commitments is making, as everybody around the room is aware, very very difficult in circumstances. So, and we are reliant on our, um, our uh, the um, constituent councils as our delivery partners. And um, if there were to be a, an issue where there is a section 114 notice, um, that would mean that the delivery partners would be restricted in what they could do. So for example, we wouldn't be able to 
um, enter into any new contracts and would have to concentrate on essential service delivery. So it's just recognizing um, that we work together with delivery partners, what those risks are, um, they're largely outside of our control, but we need to be acutely aware of, of what those, those risks are, um, what our contractual commitments uh, and um, joint commitments are with um, our partner organisations and to be able to, to manage those. So I think it's, it's right in this um, economic climate and with the, um, the situation that the, uh, the constituent um, councils are in, and our delivery partners that we are, um, uh, you know, that is, um, you know, uh, very clear and utmost in our in our minds in terms of um, awareness of what the, the the current and potential future situation might be. Yeah, uh, I'm not quite sure why this is on our agenda, um, Mr. Chair. I don't see it as part of our remit. We obviously talked earlier on about. Uh, this sort of information might be useful for um, deciding what sort of work internal audit should be doing, but this isn't really the business of the Audit and Governance Committee, is it? Uh, it we have been looking at the corporate re re register and satisfying or not satisfying ourselves on the way that combined authority manages its risk as a governance process yeah. from the very beginning. And yeah, um, so John may want to come in on this. Um, so within the functions of the Audit and Governance Committee are to review and assess the authority's risk management, among other items. And, and the approach of our internal auditor um, is, is, is to give centrality to the risk register as a tool for seeing um, how the organisation is so so it is it's considered to be relevant to this committee to 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 to, to review that regularly to see what where risks are um, and, and to consider um, as we've heard on the earlier item whether to to to, re, to change uh, any any risk uh, sorry any work programming but also um, given this committee's role in, in in assessing risk management internal control and corporate governance um, to therefore comment up to the board in relation to anything that they consider is um, noteworthy from, from the register itself. So uh, Cambridge, we had changes to the way risk management is, is, uh, is managed um, at our meeting this week. Um, and I understand that would be perhaps the, the remit of, of, of this committee, um, but uh, this report doesn't give me any information on, on how the, the processes work, if you like, who decides, et cetera. Um, so um, I suppose that's my concern as much as anything. Is that, sorry, is that the processes of, of determining how the risk is understood and described? It's, Robert, it's really the controls is what we should be looking for, um, and, and I'm not really getting a flavour from this report. All I can do, of course, is see the words and see well, the scores. I, could, honestly, I think um, <coughs> it has not been our practice, I'm not even sure it's appropriate to look at the controls, it's to satisfy ourselves that risk management is alive. We've done, we review the policies from time to time. If we have concerns, we can ask people to look at the internal auditors to have a look at a particular aspect um, and what you see before you today is our custom and practice which has been developed over the first four years and we it, it continues to evolve i think if you uh i'm not sure we're competent to say what are the right controls in an operation environment what we are competent to say is are, are we satisfied that the combined authority is managing it, it's transparent, and that they are taking action. Uh, and that has been our practice in the past, and I, I'm familiar with the four audit committees I've sat on in my life, that this is the appropriate approach. Well, in, in which case it may or may not be appropriate for me to comment on the, the score then. Um, 
there's a lot in the media about energy prices and um, difficulties in getting materials, uh, partly due to lorry drivers, but partly just due to the general economic situation. Uh, is, is, is it reasonable that some of these likelihood scores are uh, or should be higher than they are, um, particularly the, the, the top three, which relate partly to the operation of the authority, delivery of objectives and external delivery partners? I, I, I think that is exactly our role. Uh, uh, if we don't feel a risk is appearing, I mean, we how you, risk is a judgment in the end. I mean, you, you can do the, you expect the, the executive to do lots of sums to give it some calibration. But I've often worked, or always work on the basis, do I, what I see on the top, in the register as a top risk with an organization is what I would expect. And if it's changing um, enough from what we sense. And I think if we have a, we have had in the past, and I, Think we should continue to do so if we have a recommendation that we think uh, could you could do we think that in that example you've chosen that the combined authority board needs to satisfy itself that the, that the scoring is appropriate with the circumstances that are just going on we have made those recommendations and if you want to propose one we'll see if we go along with it so your 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 point i take was have the risks fully reflected the consequences of the of the disruption to supply chains is that well i i think that's a good recommendation to put to the combined authority board that when we're reviewing the rich register they should satisfy themselves that it does that are we happy to make that as a recommendation good it's a nuanced thing between looking at is the top level right as opposed to the Decision about what, however, they decide to work it out, which is which I've always felt is outside our gift. Okay, anything else? Lovely. So, can we? We've noted it. Um, I think we need to keep alive uh, your point as to making sure that we're getting we're providing value by looking at the risk register um, regularly as we do. And we have a recommendation which I think is a good one. Thank you very much. Now on a subject which I am less likely to find, because I just find it rather a challenge, we go to the last item on the agenda, well, the last substantive item, which is the information governance update. It says, Joanna, Pete and Sue Hall. Sorry, Joanna, have we met before? No, we haven't. OK, I saw your face at the back and wondered why you should be so interested in it. So, so please introduce. Go oh, drama. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the recommendations before the committee today are to note the information governance update, note the data on corporate complaints and freedom of information requests, note the new GDPR policies and recommend to the CA board that it approves and adopts the policies, recommend the CA board delegate authority to the monitoring officer to make consequential amendments to the policies. By way of background, the committee was last updated in March when it was agreed that six monthly updates would be given to the committee. Since the last update, the new GDPR policies and forms have been created. These are shown in appendices one to seven. The author of these policies is a partner from Peterborough City Council. Officers have been asked to complete mandatory data protection training. And today is the final day for completing this training. Uh, we'll run a report after today and take a view. Um, updates from Soccer Tim on the IT governance recommendations from the original report prepared in October 2020 are shown in the table set out 2.4. Within the report, there's also Soccer Tim's recommendations for going forward. 
in relation to FOIs and complaints for the period from the beginning of June to the end of August, there were 12 FOI requests, no corporate or whistleblowing complaints. Uh, we will be giving a further update in six months' time. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members. <laughs> uh, I think these are extremely useful. I love that if you only read this page, start here, I could cope with that. Um, it, it, some of them say um, this applies to anyone delivering a service on our behalf and includes partners. So the one question is to what extent are districts and county council and others signed up to, to this? And somewhere in it, and I can't immediately find it, it refers to service users. And I know Peterborough City Council, Cambridge City County Council refer to people that it provides a service to as a service user. But to what extent does that really apply to CPCA people that we deal with? Well, no, I'm happy to jump in. Do you, do you want me to just drop your mic? Um, thanks. So, um, lots of questions there. Um, so, so it's very situation specific in terms of which delivery partners would need to abide by this and where, where we were asking them to do so. That it would be in the contract that we had in place with them. How many instances would they be actually processing data on our behalf? Um, it's probably very minimal. Um, delivery partners. Yeah, we're, we're off, we're, when we deliver, it's, it's often around infrastructure schemes. So, so the so personal and sensitive information isn't, isn't in terms of GDPR controls. Isn't really the stuff of it. But um, that that's the start position that, that we, um, on a policy level, expect where it's appropriate to have the appropriate agreement in place. Yeah, um, and and staffing as part of the terms and conditions of the contract. Um, yeah, sorry, were there other questions as well? The other comment was about the quote set on service users and whether that's an applicable term in CPCA business or not. So it could chair, there is the context, for example, of, of um, passenger transport, um, bus services, there's, there's clearly personal information, potentially sensitive personal information that would be processed by the CPCA. Uh, in relation to that, um, they would be the service users, and then it's likely to, that, that they are what's called in the in the legislation data subjects. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a couple of comments. Really, I guess, like myself, most members have undertaken GDPR training in their constituent authorities, so. Uh, Members, I would guess all of us have done that. I'll leave others to confirm or, or not. Uh, we are being asked to approve or recommend these to the Combined Authority Board to approve. There are one or two, it needs tidying up in places. So I put it that way. If somebody could have a, another look at it, I sent through one comment about on page 100. It refers to training on a page identified as error bookmark not defined. But then when I look through the policy, I can't find anything on training either. So could somebody just go through it before we send it on to the Combined Authority Board just to tidy those bits up? Thank you, David, uh, as ever. Uh, but these are these are matters of editorial, not substance. So we're, we're happy with the document as a whole. Oh, I was going to say, because, because I couldn't find training in there, if you were going to put in that, I heard you say that the staff training that, that was finishing today, if you're going to expect members to undergo training as well, I suspect we have all already done that. So please don't ask us to do it again. Anybody else? So are we happy to, we've noted uh, the update, the incidences of FOI and complaints and the GDR policies. And are we happy to recommend to the Combined Authority Board that it adopt, proves and adopts the policies for GDPR and that it delegates to the monitoring officer uh, consequential amendments um, as required. Yes, okay, thank you. 
Uh, that brings us to the last item, which is the place of the next meeting, which is slightly complicated. Uh, we are going to, uh, you will be asked for uh, a time uh, to do an online informal session in the week commencing 25th of August, October, sorry, by Anne. Uh, she's going to try Doodle for those who've not used Doodle before, but you might find that an easy way of doing it for her. Um, the officers will look for this um, uh, looking forward meeting with directors, uh, horizon scanning uh, as a hybrid as soon as it can practically be done. And our next scheduled meeting is the 26th of November in the new Shire Hall at Alcombe. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Brad. Thank you, everybody. Good, good level of debate. Huh? Productive morning. Thank you. Turn off mics off just